Hello, everyone. This is Artemis with the Uncivilized Podcast. Today, I have Dr. Sarah Lacey, Assistant Professor of Anthropology of the University of Delaware. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm very excited. For those that don't know, uh, there's been a lot of work, not just from Dr. Sarah Lacey, uh, but generally from the anthropology, particularly spearheaded by women, uh, kind of this overturning of the man, the you know, man, the hunter, woman, the gatherer, or woman, the homemaker. Uh, but recently, uh, Sarah Lacey and Tara Okabach uh, did two pieces recently, Woman the Hunter, the Physiological Evidence, and Woman the Hunter, the Archaeological Evidence. Is that correct? Was it American Anthropologist? Yeah. And so, you know, these pieces, I think, were, were really interesting. They have had, for lack of a better word, very divisive uh, response, uh, what we want to get into later. But before that, I was hoping maybe we could get a little bit of context. So, Dr. Lacey, how did you kind of come around to anthropology and what is the background, particularly with your interest to this, this critique of the man the hunter? Sure. So I'm, I'm one of those people that wanted to be an archaeologist when they were a little kid. You know, my parents still have like um, art I did in childhood where, you know, I wrote Egyptologist or archaeologist, like, you know, horrendously misspelled. But I just knew that, like, that's what I was into. Uh, and it, when I actually applied to college, uh, that's when I, my parents kind of gave me that check of, like, oh, well, you know, you've been saying archaeology, but, like, that's not a job. <laughs> mm-hmm. And they really encouraged me to pursue something that they saw as more kind of, like, you know, worth the cost of a college degree. So I was secretly double majoring in economics and anthropology. and like uh, a lot of other people my age graduating college in 2008 and the economy was imploding thought well why don't i actually just go after the thing that i love go get a phd the you know the job market especially for an economics major uh wasn't looking so hot that year so uh you know just because of some fortuitous things i ended up going to pursue a phd in anthropology and i had been at uh tulane university for undergrad and had a really wonderful mentor who studied Neanderthals and really just like lit the fire in me about how incredible Neanderthals are and that fire hasn't gone out. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, and it's funny growing up, I was also for me it was like the dinosaurs and Neanderthals. I was like, yo, that's so cool. And then my parents were very quickly, that's not happening. <laughs> and that's that not in a million years are you doing archaeology or anthropology. Uh so I did the next best thing, got a, a major in English. But well, yeah. And a lot of my students say the same thing. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, I used to teach at California State University, Dominguez Hills in um, South Bay of Los Angeles. And the mm-hmm. majority of my students there are first generation college students. And mm-hmm. they are getting kind of the same message from their parents of like, you're the first one going to college. We expect, you know, business, computer science, health science, something like that, that they saw a very clear connection between the major and a well paying career. And right. you know, I was trying to convince at least some of them that really had the, the, the spark for anthropology that like, no, there is actually employment. <laughs> it may not be called anthropology, but you can actually get a job. Yeah. You know, I have, uh, we've had someone on the, on, the, on the podcast before who did work as an anthropologist in Alaska, but it was not, I, I think he was called an anthropologist, but it was also like a, a kind of a longer title than that it's not just anthropologist right it's like cultural research or something to that regard and working for the alaskan government in relation to the indigenous first nations tribes there so yeah i always find that interesting that you know the connection between they they want the one-to-one your your major should match up with whatever your job title is and that you know yeah and and i could really go into that you know trying to prepare students for the job market but the second half of your question was kind of like, how did that lead into woman the hunter? And mm-hmm. part of it is just like being a woman in archaeology, there's constantly these stereotypes that are very sexed and gendered about people in the past, but also people participating in the discipline mm-hmm. that I was pushing back against. And in graduate school, I, you know, before I had gone in undergrad, I'd fallen in love with this class, Anthropology of Birth. And was just like, it blew my mind. And I knew I didn't want to have a kid anytime soon, but I was just fascinated by birth. And my plan B, if I didn't get into graduate school, was to go to midwifery school. 
Oh. So in grad school, when, you know, you know, there's always like, the, you know, the path untaken, I thought, why don't I go get trained to be a doula? And I had some friends in graduate school who had kids you know, were pregnant at the time so that I could actually like practice on them. Uh, and so it was really a fun way to both explore this other interest I had, but then it kind of opened up this other side of research potential into issues related around women and specifically around sexual reproduction and birth. And so I've continued to like teach classes on that and been an interest of mine. So when my friend Kara, who I went to graduate school with, started working on a book about women and evolution, her and I had been going back and forth about kind of what kind of things she could cover. She felt like she was a little bit overwhelmed by just kind of the huge amount of topics potentially to cover for women and evolution. Um, And she didn't feel like she had um, really established like an expertise within the discipline in that. So I thought, well, let's like, do something together. Let's do, give a talk about something, something related to this topic um, at our upcoming conference. And pretty quickly, we saw a number of papers that use this default hypothesis of like, well, men are evolved to hunt and women to gather. And we were both like, hasn't this been disproven? <laughs> like, why is this still at the time, you know, 2020, 2021? Why is this still being the default in these papers? Um, and decided that was like a great way for us to give a talk, kind of like, I don't know, do some like territory marking that like she was working on this book. Um, and the conference presentation was really well attended. They had to put like extra rows of seats in the room, which wow. was interesting. Yeah, I've, I've never had that happen, which was flattering. And it was also very like generational because the people coming up to us afterwards who were like, thank you, this was so cool. I love this. We're all like graduate students postdocs, like young people in the discipline. And then we had a few older people in the discipline very angry at us. Like, I study hunter gatherers and women don't hunt, you know, like cornering us to like tell us their opinion about it. And it's like, right. Hunt- modern hunter gatherers are not living fossils. And like, of all people, <laughs> you guys should know this. Uh, so kind of that really um, split response that we got from the field also told us that like, just because there have been lots of publications saying women could and did hunt in the past, it clearly like hadn't had not made it to like the mainstream narrative of the discipline and us p- continuing to push back on it was still necessary. And uh-huh. luckily we got approached by Scientific American saying like, we love that talk. Would you write something for us? And we said, well, like let us publish this in a peer reviewed journal first and then we'll convert it for you guys. And American Anthropologist was worked with us to be able to kind of fast track that publication process just so that we could get the pieces um, through peer review and they were pretty backed up as far as like how often things come out after peer review. And that's where oh, they yeah. sped it up for us mm-hmm. just so that it could come out. And then the very next month, a scientific American piece on the same topic. Okay. And so with that, I think there's, there's so much I want to parse out both that I already had listed in questions and those I didn't. So maybe let, let's back it up. Is where does I, where does this idea of man the hunter, woman the gatherer come from? Obviously, there's the the engendered bias of the adventurous, providing male and kind of the the homemaker woman. But how did that become established as the def, as you said the default in anthropology? Yeah, I mean, I think that narrative has been around for a lot longer, but it definitely kind of solidified itself in the '60s when there was this big. Uh, conference and then book that came out called Man the Hunter. And it really focused on this idea that hunting, male-led hunting, was this novel development in humans and that it allowed, you know, us to evolve all the things that we think are special, you know, big brains and complicated hunting techniques and stone tools. And so it really fetishized hunting. And by you know because of the way the language they were using it made it seem like evolution was acting on men and then women were these passive recipients of it and sometimes it was even kind of explicitly framed that way of like males hunt to show off to get partners and that this allowed the evolution of monogamous pair bonding and Mm -hmm. people you know there's a number of chapters in the book that like look at modern hunter-gatherers and kind of use them as these quote-unquote living fossils 
um, arguing that, oh, we see this hunter-gatherer populations today. This must have been how things were in the past. Women are, you know, rendered um, helpless, basically, by their reproduction, that lactation right. and pregnancy make it so that they can't run, they can't be away from home for long. So the necessities of motherhood tie them to the domestic sphere, whereas males are free to range out and hunt woolly mammoths and what have you. And then that story is like very compelling to people. It like justifies the current mm -hmm. world order, right? Right. It like exactly. justifies patriarchy today. It's like, oh no, it's like it's like it's an evolutionary, um, you know, predestination, basically. Yeah. And so what's, then you just see it in like the Flintstones and everywhere else, and people just stop questioning it. Yeah, and what's so weird about that is, from you know, and again, I consider myself very plainly like an amateur anthropologist, right? And in no way am I like an expert or anything like that. But what I find interesting is this idea that women are confined to domesticity by the the reproductive cycle it doesn't really add up to the levels of infanticide or like the long-term nursing that there's a longer span between births and pregnancies and hunter-gatherer communities than like agricultural communities like that just doesn't add up with what we already know about that yeah, side of it yeah absolutely like we have like we know that interbirth intervals are shorter in agricultural at sober hunter-gatherers etc and yet you still see the descriptions that like women are like you know trapped by their own reproduction and that they're constantly pregnant and, and so that somehow renders them infirm. It was hilarious working on this paper because I myself right now am eight months pregnant. And so, mm -hmm. you know, when we had some negative backlashes, a number of it was like, you're not even considering pregnancy. And I'm like, there's there's no way I've forgotten pregnancy. And I mm -hmm. also refuse to accept that I'm <laughs> rendered infirm and trapped in the house. <laughs> Right. Yeah, that just doesn't really, it just, yeah, again, it doesn't really add up to the, uh, to the rest of the evidence that is also part of the default, right? So you have these, or I should, it's not just two things, but for lack of the, in this context, there's these two contrasting aspects in, in anthropology and archaeology that are default, but don't line up with each other, right? And I find that interesting that they're, you know, we talk about the 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 living fossils, right? So I want to get into that. Can you elaborate a little bit on what you mean that hunter gatherers today are not living fossils and are not necessarily windows into the past of, say, the Paleolithic? Can you add a little bit to that? Because some people might say, well, the hunter gatherers, and I think people may not understand that the context of the Holocene is different than you know. Yeah, the, absolutely. Right. So I, I even try like. I mean, when I'm talking to a popular audience, I'll use the term hunter-gatherer because that's what they're used to. But I actually prefer, and we use in the paper, forager because I want right, to recognize right. that it's like a unified subsistence strategy, not two streams of hunters and gatherers. Um, mm -hmm. But Holocene foragers, right, they are, they've been evolving just like everybody else, right? And one, they're being influenced by their neighbors, right, mm -hmm. who are pastoralists, agriculturalists, or or, you know, urbanized population, often, which are more patriarchal. Um, but also, you know, they have a, a, a different history, right? So, like, they have been um, moved by colonial practices into areas that are not necessarily where they would prefer to be living. Like, foragers would like to live in, like, very... <laughs> Um, landscapes that are really highly productive for food, and that's not where we're finding foragers today, right? They've been moved into like really liminal environments, places where pastoralists, agriculturalists, urbanized people yes. don't want to live. So yeah, they're yeah, now yeah. living like much more difficult subsistence lives, and so they adapt to that. Understandably, it's like what makes humans special is how adaptable we are to various kinds of environments, but that's not reflective of like the majority of forager subsistence. I mean, I think about the Hadza, right, versus the, the Bantu. And before colonialism, or like thousands of years before colonialism, you have the Hadza and related foraging peoples that are are common and widespread. But the Bantu with their, oh, you know, you have the the pastoralists and the, the later the agriculturalists. And those are contradictory lifestyles and life ways to foraging life. And like what that conflict does and pushes them to, you said, 
like foragers prefer living in, I think there was a word for a study that came out recently, mosaic environments, right? They like living on the, yeah. the edge of like forests where they have access to savannas, right? Resource rich areas, but they don't have that anymore. They're like in super strict environments that don't provide everything that their ancestors would have had. And this idea that you can just ignore that just doesn't make any sense. It's, well, and also, like, the Hadza are a population who've been, like, very open to uh, foreign researchers coming in. So, like, mm -hmm. we also have this very colored idea of forager lifestyle based on, like, a few different populations that have been heavily studied. So, like, the Hadza in particular, almost everything that we think about with hunter-gatherers is based off of either the Hadza or the Kung in South Africa because mm -hmm. they've been studied for a long time and have been pretty open to foreign researchers right or even the ecotourism right that the pods are involved in that again jamie a recent uh uh podcast guest has talked about and is writing about actually is like the in the, you know the influence of the bantu and ecotourism and that like are you are they absent is there any study of them absent from that context is that just wouldn't add up either so i find all that really interesting and i guess the oh, argument sure. someone would, the argument someone would make is well, we see, you know, and I'm not, and I'm not saying this is true, but the arguments I have when this comes up is, but why is it that all of them seem to follow at least similar gendered patterns? So, what would your idea of that be? Is it because their conditions, while they might be separated by geography, is still relatively the same, right? Push to the edges, and like this might be the best possible adaption. There's a, yeah, a couple things. So one is like being influenced by their neighbors that are patriarchal. So if you've ever read any of the work by like Shan Shan Du about the Lahu in southern China, which are considered like a very egalitarian but actually agriculturalist population, they mm -hmm. have tried to maintain like these very egalitarian ways of like villages ruled by both a man and a woman, and everything like everything is like a, the, a dyad of a man and a woman together. Uh, but then the Han surrounding them come in and don't recognize the women leaders. They only recognize the male leaders. They only recognize the male side of this dyad. And so then that patriarchy starts to creep into their culture because yeah. of their neighbors. Um, but also we have you know, issues about like, um, oh gosh, I had a, such a nice answer and now it just totally spaced out on me. So I apologize. Um, but that for hunter gatherers, Oh, I had like such a good answer for this. Where did it go? Yeah. Well, you're talking about this, this idea of like, you know, when a society comes in, they, if they, they have their pre-assumptions, right? So with these, uh, these patriarchal societies only recognizing men, what that reminds me of is colonialism, particularly, you know, my understanding of colonialism in North America, right? Where we had this idea of, oh, every indigenous society had big men and chiefs that had total power. It's like, that isn't necessarily true because they, they had to adopt some of that in relation to a society that would only recognize a leader. They couldn't understand the idea of an egalitarian society where people had to come together in councils, right? But it had to elevate someone to a position in order to negotiate with them on terms that they understood and how that went well, on to influence the organization of those people. Yeah, and, those, and, and then who's writing the, the ethnography of those people, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. the, the foreign colonialists. And so if they do, there are women hunting or they do see women hunting, they don't necessarily acknowledge it. And so that's the other issue that we have to contend with when we're looking back into kind of like these big ethnographic databases is, and this was a paper put out by Carol Walsh Scheffler in her lab um, at Seattle Pacific that came out this last year as well, was mm -hmm. going back and looking at these databases and saying, actually, you know, a majority of the cultures have descriptions of women hunting but they, when they do the summaries, they leave them out. Or they yeah. act like the women hunting was like, well, that was only because something happened bad that year and a number of men died and so women had to step up. Or they come up with some sort of justification for why that behavior was aberrant or mm -hmm. not defining of the, of the community. Or they mm -hmm. just ignored it all together, right? But right. When you're thinking about being a forager, you have to be flexible. Things change year to year. Yeah, people die and people change roles. And that these roles are really flexible and fluid because they have to be for people to survive. And so right. it's funny as the outsider to come in and say, oh, well, you know, cherry pick what is what they expect to see based off mm -hmm. of the patriarchy that they're bringing with them. Um, and 
and I, I that's why I really like the paper from the lab at Seattle Pacific because they went back into that and said like no in their field notes they say all these sorts of things it just doesn't end up in the summary yeah you know I think what I find interesting about that is that when the, the criticism I saw and you know I think part of this and I'm sure you have thoughts is how often paper what the paper or research says and like the journalism around it says right isn't always one-to-one -one, and people are responding to the articles representation of the, the the research or the journal as opposed to the research itself and so i found people like well this the research shows like oh it only say a woman hunted when she was out gathering and she killed like a lizard or a monkey and she took it back it's like for first of all there's a few things to say to that is sure that's fair but it's like is that not hunting so now our, our conception of hunting has to be big game parties for some reason as opposed to like a woman might be out forging with a band of women, a family unit, or like her child or by herself. And if she kills something, brings that that for some reason doesn't count as hunting. And I don't grasp that. How is that not, not hunting? Well, you're making a perfect point because actually one of the physiology paper, not the archaeology paper, had a response commentary from a couple people who study modern hunter gatherers. And we just submitted our response to their commentary. So this hasn't been published yet. But one okay. of the things they said was they described women hunting smaller game as small game foraging. And they mm -hmm. redefined hunting as only being large game and then said women don't hunt. But that doesn't make sense either because then <laughs> in, the, in the end of the Paleolithic, going into the Mesolithic, you have a broad, what is it, the broad, oh, broad resource revolution? I, I'm yeah. Making, yeah, this idea of moving from you know, mammoth hunt, large, you know, multi, you know, you need a lot, a large hunting party to bring down this megafauna. And, and because of the loss of that by climate change or arguably human pressure, you move to like rabbits. You see that the adoption of snares, fishing becomes more widespread. Oh, so are we saying that only middle Paleolithic people were hunters and everything after that wasn't by that definition? Right. right? And, the, and, the, and the innovation of the, you know, unique kinds of hunting tools to do that, right? The bow and arrow, the atlatl, snares, hunting nuts, all of these things would have made hunting less physiologically stressful for everyone, right? Right. Hunt bow and arrows, atlatls, hunting snares, those are good for women too. <laughs> right. Well, there was this, this was a, I wish I had this in front of me, that something found that the adoption of the atlatl would eat. It, studies show that men and women perform nearly equally with the induction, introduction of the autolotl, but, but it's weird. So when you see that, women are more likely, they tend to be more egalitarian, but the bow and arrow, if they skip the autolotl and go straight to the bow and arrow, they're less egalitarian because you very rarely see women use bow and arrows, but they're more likely to use autolotl. So it's very strange how that these like tools, which of course influence society and the feedback loop created by that. Right. So I just. Yeah. So there was, I think you might be thinking, I guess, of the stuff that came out of Kent State this last year, where they were had students throwing spears, and there was a pretty big gender gap in accuracy and speed with throwing spears. Then again, like they're using modern, you know, college students, where mm -hmm. boys have often been socialized to throw a lot more than than American girls are, and like how how like relevant are college students to this. But then they had them throw with the atlatl, and the differences between their accuracy and speed decreased. So the atlatl okay. was a way to kind of like narrow the gap, at least in like these modern students that they were using to experiment with this. And I just heard there's a paper coming out that has not been published yet, uh, where they actually found that pregnant women ha were very good at using the atlatl. And I guess it's something about kind of the change in your center of gravity with being mm -hmm. in your third trimester made them even better atlatl throwers which I thought was oh. fabulous. Oh, interesting. Yeah, this idea, <laughs> it just doesn't really follow that, like, you know, and I guess something I want to say, and this is to me the underlying issue I have uh, when I get into these kind of arguments or debates, is people say, well, the research has shown X. In your new research, which is very political or very motivated, says Y. But that assumes the original research was not motivated by an agenda in and of itself. First of yeah. all, the idea that anthropology, right, as an institution, is it was and arguably, well, is still very colonial and racist. I remember I had a conversation with someone uh, who said that, you know, it's actually the person sitting in front of me, our good friend Malatha. Uh, one said that, it, how long did it take for Europeans to start digging up their own bones? 
right? As opposed to the bones of other groups, usually the ones that they colonized, right? And so like the inherent bias that exists in anthropology itself, is this a revision of history or is it perhaps a course correction that needed to happen, right? This idea that what's original must be more objective, that just doesn't make sense either, you know? Oh, especially within the discipline of anthropology. So we're hoping this is more of a, a course correction um, but certainly if we get into like, you know, some of the backlash on Twitter, that's not necessarily how people saw it. They saw it as like woke revisionist history. Right. Yeah. Let's just, let's lean into that a little bit. And then I want to circle back to the studies themselves, but let's, let's talk about the response both in academia, which you've touched on a little bit and outside of it. Primarily I'm interested in what's happening inside academia. Um, how is the response to your research? You said it's kind of generational, but I'm also curious, what is the intersection of that with with gender, if at all? The, within academia, the response has been generally quite positive. Um, I've been invited to like talk to grad student reading groups that were reading our papers or, you know, um, been approached by often what, there's a bit of a generation, they tend to be younger students or, you know, postdocs or junior people who are really excited about this. Like, thank you for doing this. I've been saying this forever. You know, we needed to put a nail in this coffin. Um, there has been like a little bit of pushback, um, mostly from more senior people who, you know, are kind of like have staked their careers on <laughs> this certain narrative. Um, mm -hmm. But most of it's been like really supportive and lovely. And even the kind of pushback about it is more like questions. It's not, it's, it's very collegial. It's been generally quite nice uh, with the exceptions of like a few Evo evolutionary psych people on Twitter mm -hmm. who like we could get into like evolutionary psych and it's very adversarial relationship with anthropology. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's generally been pretty good. I think where that breakdown happened was, so we wrote the scientific American piece, which does not include like the crazy amount of data that we had in our two peer reviewed pieces, which we mm -hmm. had to have as two pieces just because they were, there was just so much to cover that we thought we got to break this into two sister papers as opposed to like one massive paper. And then we tried to like distill, you know, what was, you know, over 20,000 words down to less than 3000 words for scientific American. And that's where people were thinking that they've come up with all these kind of got you's. Well, you didn't talk about this. So you didn't consider this. All of these things that they brought up were covered in the American anthropologist papers. But again, as you mentioned before about sometimes how, you know, the media byline summarizing the piece may not actually do it justice. We had a lot of people reacting really negatively to some of these like one, two sentence media summaries on Twitter and elsewhere that suggested oh. that like women were better hunters than men. And in some cases, which women you probably... don't say at all, which you <laughs> don't, even, that's not even brought up. And again, that's what I'm talking about. The journalism, which is all based on flits and lights, knows this is going to piss people off. And they Ye didn't fucking yeah. read it. <laughs> yes, yes. So we didn't say that. And I'm sure in plenty, many of examples, there were women who were much better hunters than some of their male contemporaries. But they argued that somehow we were are suggesting that like, men didn't hunt and that only women hunted. And so we got a lot of like, what are the men doing? Men can't lactate, men can't gestate, what are they doing? As if we're saying that they're not hunting, right? And all we're arguing is that like, the totality of evidence up until you know, the upper Paleolithic a little bit, and then really not until the Neolithic, that there is no gender division of labor. So everybody's doing the same things. So they're having the same risks, the same traumas, the same wear and tear on their bodies. And then the physiology side was emphasizing that like, this idea that women are not capable of this because of being rendered infirm by their reproduction, or that they're somehow weaker, um, doesn't bear out that like estrogen yeah. is actually a really important hormone for physical activity, especially endurance activities, especially for things that have a lot of like um, muscle breakdown. Estrogen is really important for helping to preserve muscle, muscle repair, all these things. Cause so much of the story is like the magic of testosterone and not realize recognizing how much estrogen is also doing for athletic activity. Um, right. So well, that's you know, we're coming in for both sides, but people don't like that. <laughs> yeah, well, there's an intersection there. So uh, I consider myself broadly like genderqueer. I don't really get into like the labels about it, but like perhaps trans woman or trans feminine 
are just as valid. And in the arguments I have with people about the biology argument, uh, perhaps this needs to be stated, is that far too many people don't realize women, people, you know, that it didn't, you know, are assigned male, female at birth naturally have testosterone and people assigned male at birth naturally have estrogen. And I think people forget you have both to varying levels. And that's kind of decides a lot of your hormonal balance is you have all, you have both of those. And those are also not the only hormones in your body. And I think people totally have fucking forgotten that is there. People have both. And it's just crazy to me. Well, that doesn't have both that like the, right. There might be an average that biological females have more estrogen than testosterone and on average biological males have more testosterone than estrogen. But Mm -hmm. these values can vary quite a bit between populations, between individuals. And and that really gets into all the stuff about sports, right? About wanting to like testosterone test women who are competing in women's events. And if they have, you know, levels of testosterone that are considered high for a woman, somehow they're barred from competition. Because or they testosterone have to take, is this magical yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. Or they have to take hormone balances, right? They have to they have to reduce their naturally high testosterone to make people feel more comfortable with the fact that that's just a woman that just doesn't fit their idea of womanhood. And it again, I, yeah, wow. Yeah, it, it, and not even recognize just how much it changes within the life course, right? Mm-hmm. Like even myself, I I had a in my late twenties a period where I had really high testosterone. And I broke out in acne. And the doctor was like, oh, take spirolactone. And I was like, I don't think so. <laughs> I'll just treat the acne. And like over time, my testosterone levels came back down. I think there was like, there's some stress things going on there and stuff. But just the fact of like, oh, well, to be normal, you should take spirolactone. I was like, oh my goodness, this is like, we, I think this also really gets into a point that Kara would make if she was here, which is that we have so little research on these things. It's only just mm-hmm. beginning to be done. And right. unfortunately, we have these like very narrow ideas, very limited amount of data that people are making decisions of massive consequences based on. Mm-hmm. A- absolutely. Um, you know, and c- kind of going into, you mentioned this earlier, we we're talking about the, the research that came with the, you know, the autolotls and the spear throwing and that they took college age people, per, you know, coming out of our type of society. But it's also, if we want to talk about hormones more, it's like, and I know nothing about this, and perhaps, you know, if Kara was here, could have spoken to it. Um, it would, to be clear, I did to reaffirm that was the co-author for these two pieces that we're talking about. Um, but the hormonal dip, balance difference between the average paleolithic hunter-gatherer, which again, based off ecosystem and diet and time and geography would have changed, but it's like, how do we, what does that def- difference look like on an epigenetic level today versus then? Our diets are huge, you know, that's a huge influence, you know, and we at Uncivilized are critical, ironically, because we do a podcast of technology and civilization and things of that nature. But it's like, then that for other primitivists who I get into arguments with, who I would consider to be more conservative, who are very like, they kind of, they uphold the man, the hunter idea, or like, they don't question that at all. They like to talk about how they're anti that and stuff like that but they refuse to talk about how it might be inf- influence hormones and then how that relates to like the gender division of labor in, in sports and things of like that today right and so and there's a lot of cognitive dissonance is what i'm trying to get at um, oh, oh for sure and like we don't have an, enough information to be able to kind of say what would have been like normal testosterone and estrogen levels in paleolithic peoples but mm-hmm. you know we're kind of limited to modern foragers but like especially like testosterone like it's the weirdos are young people today with high levels of testosterone in western environments because mm-hmm. you know, as pe- as people age they get diagnosed with things like low T right because their testosterone levels have come down but they're coming down to levels that are normal throughout the life course in right. modern foragers oh so like, interesting it, it, yeah, like, you know, so it, who's pathological, right? So we've like created this disorder of low T and, you know, prescribing testosterone creams and things like that to uh, middle aged men who report being depressed. Um, but like, what's really unusual when you're comparing them kind of pan globally is how high their testosterone levels are as young men, not where they are as as older men. That's so, I had no idea about that. That's really interesting because you always hear, oh, men on average have lower testosterone. And now there's this whole industry of bullshit solutions 
to like what is it the sunning you know what i'm talking about with like oh Tucker my god perineal sunning <laughs> Yeah, that is, oh my God. Or, and it's, again, kind of back to the trans issue. And I don't want to keep making it about this. I apologize. But like how it's, it's, it's mentally ill and weird for people to want to take hormones to, from their gender, but someone who has low T, they're older and they do it. And that's somehow not gender affirming care. I don't quite <laughs> grasp how those are different. And, and you know? actually the trans issue is, is really relevant here because you know, we made just some very minor statements in both pieces, just trying to clarify our language, because we are talking about sex and people are trying to reconstruct aspects of gender roles from that. But we wanted to be really clear that like, these things are not binary, these things are on the spectrum, we're limited in what we can say, we're citing other people who used a binary. And so it's really hard to add that nuance back in, but that we are aware. And yeah. that was like the, mo the most attacked sentence in the scientific American piece, and yes. you know, these, <laughs> right? And it was like proof that scientific American is woke, woke bullshit science because they claim that sex and gender are on a spectrum. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah, and I, you know, and it gets interesting. And Malatha mentioned earlier, actually, when I, I muted and he said something, is that talking about like the ethnography and the histories about women who are hunting and how many of those people history has, you know, while we suppress the idea of the two spirit or other, you know, that's a very quote unquote, like pan Indian term now that isn't inclusive of all cultures, but the idea, how many of them would have been considered that, but they were just women who hunted, right? They were doing this gender queer, what we might see as like gender queer because they're breaking out of the binary. We are associating with them. You know what I mean? And yeah, it's interesting how, how are the erasure of women in history in that sense. I'm sure it's not super widespread, but the possibility of that also, we're associating them as, as men as opposed to just women who did something we think is masculine, if that makes some sense. Actually, it's probably pretty, pretty like at least the erasure of it is probably pretty widespread. Um, there is yeah. a paper just this year looking at like the Neolithic versus the Bronze Age in Europe and arguing mm -hmm. like just looking at grave goods, like the idea of like gender is very, um, age bound so it's something that makes sense for like reproductive aged adults but doesn't make mm -hmm. sense for children and the elderly and then you look even like in in inuits today right um <laughs> well like not today i guess sub recent um where like again gender is something that makes sense for post puberty individuals but doesn't apply in the same way for those before puberty yes right? okay yeah and so like these things are not like set in your life course. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So I, I kind of want to pull us back to the studies. So you have the archaeological evidence and the physiological evidence. And you touched on something earlier I'm really, really interested in the, the, the injuries and the wear and tear on the bodies and the evidence that we have. Can you touch a bit on what that looks like and the implications of it for your argument? Sure. Yeah. So um, you know, as I said before, I specialize in Neanderthals and early modern humans in, in Europe and Southwest Asia. And when we look at their bodies, right, um, there's really no difference. Like, it's not that like, oh, the, the skeletons that have been sex male have lots of trauma from hunting woolly mammoths and the female ones are all insulated from risk. No, everybody has the same trauma. They have the same wear and tear. Everybody, like, in Neanderthals, every relatively complete skeleton over the age of 25 shows healed broken bones, regardless of sex. We suggest that everyone is doing the same kinds of risky activities, right? Like, and, and we're assuming it's like large game ambush hunting. Um, and, you know, to some of the critics, right, who are like, well, they would never have let a nine-month pregnant woman go out and hunt a mammoth. Well, okay, sure, maybe there are like, various times in the life course where there might be some risk remediation going on, but all mm -hmm. these indicators are cumulative lifetime indicators, right? So in the cumulative course of the life, these individuals are all being exposed to the same things. Right, right. Or like the idea, like, again, with that the nine month pregnant person, you know, woman isn't going and hunting. So, okay. And a man might be sick and he's not hunting. So is he not a hunter? Can he not have hunted because yeah. he was sick at one point? And again, I'm not trying to conflate, but it's the same thing. There is a, condition that is different from the average right and yeah yes. she might not go hunting but we also know 
even in studies of highly gendered hunting parties, the women are still venturing with them and are at the hunting camps. So they're still present in some way with the hunting party. So this idea that women would have just stayed at the original base camp, that also just isn't true because women are at least in some way involved with the hunting, even in contemporary foraging societies. And it also assumes that people are only of value when they're food procuring. And yet we mm -hmm. look at like Neanderthals where there's so much evidence of care, individuals who have amputated arms, Shedidaria. people who have no, yeah, who don't have any teeth, right? And they're being cared for by their population, even if like what they're contributing may not look like big game hunting anymore. Yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, and I, yeah, it just this idea, it's because again, because we live in a capitalist society today, um, we tend to apply this idea that you, you are as worthy of as much as you provide for the economy, right? Yeah. So we apply yes. an economic model to hunter-gatherer, you know, hunter-gatherer and foraging people. And a good friend of the podcast and myself personally, Steve Kirk, has talked about trying to apply economic analysis to hunter-gatherers is just bullshit, right? We might use that term in a broad kind of subsistence kind of way, but that just doesn't make sense. Like, if you ask a hunter-gatherer about their economy, they're going to look at you like, what the fuck are are you talking about yeah. well and I, and I mentioned before right that i double majored in economics and anthropology in undergrad and i bring those kind of questions of discipline all the time like the reason why i'm interested in these questions of demography and what it was like for like the lived experience of these individuals comes from my economics training but also mm. like my economics training made me very um uninterested in being involved in the current discipline of economics that's didn't really align very well with my <laughs> political worldview. Yeah. Can you, can you elaborate a bit on what you mean by that? Oh, well, like, uh, there was a number of classes where I was the only woman in my econ classes. Mm -hmm. And the things that I heard were, like, pretty distasteful. But a good example is uh, I was in labor economics, the only woman in the class, the only person passing the class. And the professor got really frustrated one day, and he started yelling at all the other students, and he was like, Sarah's going to make 72 cents on every one of your dollars. If you can explain to me her incentive to do well in this class, despite that outcome, I'll pass you. And all the guys what? in the classroom were, de <laughs> were dead Holy silent. Holy shit. <laughs> and afterwards, he like kept me after class, and he's like, you're going to go to grad school in economics, right? And I was like, I'm going to grad school, but not in economics. Oh, that's, I could, holy shit. As a teacher, I just... <laughs> You know, we I have come close to making points like that incidentally, but I could not actually imagine saying something like that. I mean, that um, is kind of the magic of teaching college students is like we don't have to censor ourselves quite as much and we can be like a little bit more honest, right? We mm -hmm. don't have to like protect protect their little virginal ears. Right, right. Uh so with with the studies, what are the methods? Are these you know, are these more for what I, I guess this word like survey studies or like how much original research versus survey I, is that is that the right way to frame it so yeah our pieces are review pieces so our pieces are not mm -hmm. necessarily like original research this is us pulling together the work of others to you know support a thesis that we're putting forward but it's like they're review papers mm -hmm. but most of the people that like for the archaeology paper we're either citing people who are archaeologists who are doing like analysis of grave goods or we're citing paleopathologists and in some cases myself as a paleopathologist mm -hmm. um, doing like um, large analyses of the skeletal remains um, mm -hmm. and then for the ph physiology paper a lot of that stuff's actually coming out of more um, modern studies of athletes of college students right arguing for like the roles of estrogen the roles of um, endurance hunting sex differences Etc. So some stuff we might be citing is also kind of maybe meta analysis, but we really tried to mostly cite the primary literature so that like, yeah, we are pulling everything together, but everyone we're citing are are you know independent, peer reviewed scientific work. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so I just did a quick, you know, the I'm basically a scholar just like you because I Googled something and uh <laughs> Uh, I wanted to look up a little bit more because I also wanted to talk about the the physiological research because you're talking about muscle growth. Uh, you know, I'm so I, I'm a long term runner, 
Um, you know, I've done, you know, 10 Ks and stuff like that. What I find interesting when we talk about gender difference in sports, um, you know, it's always like men are always winning and for a large part. Yeah, that's true. But the argument falls apart when it, men are, it's, it's not just all the men finish and then all the women finish. Right. That's I, I show me a single race where that happens. Right. It's always, you know, the top three finishers might be men, but then it's a lot of women and then more men and then more women. Right. And so we didn't talk about we the, have, yeah, all that. Well, there was a lot of like comments on like Twitter, right? There were people like, well, you know, women, you claiming women are good at endurance, but there's, you know, the fastest marathon times are always a man. And then you have to like question, okay, well, the difference of like two hours versus two hours and 11 minutes, how much, first of all, those are people operating at the extremes of human endurance, mm -hmm. but also like in kind of like running after an antelope, how much does that time difference actually matter as like um, an outcome of a successful hunt? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. women do actually start to win once you do like the ultra marathon distances, right? When you're talking about... 50 miles, 100 miles, that's where you start to actually see women outpacing men. But mm -hmm. kind of so, like yeah. the, the actual, like, kind of the average good athletic runner, the differences are fairly minor. And mm -hmm. how those would actually, like, impact, like, the success of a hunt, I think, are, are negligible. So this emphasis yeah. that, like, you know, constantly the fastest marathon time goes to a man is not, I don't think, undermines our argument at all. Right. But then also, and you touched on this, the longer you add distance, the, th that gap becomes extremely narrow. And that actually, the studies always show it has to do with estrogen levels. Estrogen levels are extremely important. You've talked about that. Because what I want to say is that like estrogen increases anabolic response to exercise. And that, that yeah. has some relation to muscle growth, but also preserving muscle strength. You know, yeah, I'm surprised that you know yeah. that like people aren't like doping with estrogen, right? <laughs> yeah, where's it in your cycle with Tren or Ten? Where's it in the cycle? Because you know I'm in the gym and you know I'm 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 fairly small. I'm about I'm just under six foot. I'm about 155 pounds. I'm very like muscle lean, but there's people you know, and I haven't had like tests on my um on my hormones, but like I'm you know I'm consider myself within the average probably with slightly higher estrogen levels right and then i look at um and i've had conversations with people who use steroids and are on cycles and what's interesting too is like the impact of estrogen on them because when you when you shoot your body with a bunch of like extra testosterone your body meets it a little bit with estrogen right And they're like at first i didn't like it but i realized how important that is right as long as they're not nuking their body with estrogen Right, mm -hmm. that in some way it actually it helps them, and so it's like, and and so it gets into interesting conversations when we talk about gender and sex and what that looks like with like the balance again of hormones. But you know, I'm having a random ass like five a.m. conversations with like a with a bodybuilder at plant at like Planet Fitness <laughs> about <laughs> estrogen and and how he uses trend and all stuff like that. But it also, you know, as an aside, reminds me of a Fight Club with Bob and the fact that he used too much steroids. And it, you know, but that's neither here nor there. Sorry, I just, I and, and the body does that respond with right that, right? If you yeah. like inject a ton of testosterone, the body responds by producing estrogen, right? Because mm -hmm. it's trying to kind of even these things out, and then they, you know, are upset that they have gynomastia and things like that. But right, <laughs> your body doesn't want to just have all of one hormone. These things are supposed to be in a balance with one another because they're all really important for normal physiological functioning. Mm -hmm. So with uh, with the with the archaeological evidence, besides what we see on the skeletal remains themselves, what do the artifacts, like the tools and anything like that, what do those tell us about the possibility or assurance of of women hunters? Yeah, so when we look at like things like grave goods, right? And people didn't start burying the dead till the last hundred thousand years, so earlier than that, yeah. we don't have grave goods, but you know, there's no kind of uh, sex differences in what they're placing into the burial. And the assumption is like, these are items that are being sent to either the, you know, the afterlife with this individual, or were items that were important in life to this individual. And we don't see any sex differences, right? It's not that males are getting buried with atolatols and females are getting buried with sewing needles, right? That's just like not the case. 
Mm-mm. Maybe in the Neolithic, but not in the Paleolithic. Yeah. But also, some of the, the things is this like the ways that those the language gets really gendered around some of these things where there actually is no evidence. So, like it's stone tools, like constantly foot nappers are described in masculine terms, hunting tools are described in masculine terms, then processing tools, which are assumed to be more domestic, um, get used in these like feminine or terms which is really funny because they're assuming that men are making all the stone tools but then like when the tool gets used for a domestic job that like feminizes it yeah and, funny that <laughs> yeah but if you look at like you know modern foragers people make the tools they use so mm-hmm. it's if you're if you're going to try to play this oh women are just in the domestic sphere game then they still have to be capable of flint napping because they're making the stone tools that are processing the leather hides but What's yeah. fun with Neanderthals is that like they are using their teeth as kind of a third hand when they're processing leather hides. Yeah. Call it paramasticatory tool, it, it, paramasticatory you know um, use of the teeth, and they show both males and females the same wear pattern. So not only are like women going out and hunting with the men, the men are staying home and processing leather hides with the women. These you know behaviors are not gendered; <laughs> they're not sex. Everyone does everything because you live in a small group. You know, Neanderthal groups were anywhere from like, you know, reconstructed to be on average anywhere between 10 and 30 people, half of those people being children and adolescents. So we're saying Mm -hmm. like five to 15 adults. If you have five to 15 adults in your group, you can't have like, oh, I'm a lady and I don't participate in that activity. Like, no, everyone has to be flexible. Everyone has to be capable of doing every role. Because season to season, year to year, like things are changing. Everyone needs to be capable of doing everything or the group is not going to survive. I mean, it just seems mm-hmm. like very practical. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's interesting. But I remember reading something long ago. And again, a lot of this is me going off memory. Is that the, while it's true, all Neanderthals or transgender have the wear on their teeth. Is that the wear on the teeth was different? It, do, is that sound familiar at all? Like, do you know what, like, how that might represent a possible division of labor or an argument for division of labor among hunter, or, uh, Neanderthals? Was how the teeth wear represented itself, like on the on the teeth, or how it how it shaped the Go teeth? Go back and look at the the Freyer paper, but I don't believe that there was. There is some differences that show like handedness, like left handed mm. versus right handed, okay. um, but not any sex differences. Okay, because yeah, okay, I had to look it up again. In 2015, it was that, uh, regarding the distribution of dental shipping, the prevalence of the strait is higher in the maxillary dentition of males, whereas females have the majority of dental shipping on their mandibular teeth. I'm totally fucking that up. Mandib- mandibular teeth. I don't know what that means. But does that sound in some way what you saw or anything like that? Or is it totally based outside of the, the handedness? Was it pretty I much? I have to look because I'm wondering if that's uh, John Wilman. Work. It's uh, we, 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 it's, we went to grad school together. It's Rosas and uh, Stalrich. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, I know them. Um, so that would be just about the uh, El Cedron individuals. Is that the case? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, yes. So I don't know if that would that um, difference applies more broadly, but at that location, they found that pattern. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, I always find it. Yeah, I found it that interesting because there's a. I'm a big fan of PBS Eon, the YouTube channel. And I remember they yeah. were talking about what that told us about handedness, and they were they had this really cool graphic. The graphics are awesome. Yeah, like you said, it's like a third hand. Your ability to like have two hands, you might be stretching the hide on one end, you're stripping it with the ne- your other hand, but you're holding it in your teeth, right? Like the making of the tools like that is really interesting to me. I again, growing up and thinking about Neanderthal or Neanderthal and. You know, going and my understanding of it is, you know, growing up and how much of it changed from this big hairy brute to like someone that's basically just as intelligent as us and like we interbred with them. That to me is also so fucking amazing to me. But in relation to that, you know, we always think about how, how did the Anfalls go extinct, right? And there's so many theories, but I remember one of it being because we had at that point a division of labor that the Neanderthals didn't have. By we have, I mean, Homo sapien sapien. Um, what would your response be to that, since you, your interest is in Neanderthals? Well, I'm actually working on a paper right now, kind of like, it's a method, like a, just a theoretical paper, but really pushing back against the fact that we constantly frame questions within the discipline as Neanderthal extinction. Um, mm-hmm. Because I don't think that they went extinct. <laughs> like, right, I think that's right. an unproductive 
way of framing it because there's been so many population collapses in different regions for human evolution. So why do we describe this one population as extinct, but we don't describe like all the upper Paleolithic modern humans who did not contribute to living people as right. we don't describe them as extinct, but yet, you know, genetically they are. Um, anyway, so like I, I have some strong feelings about ways that this constantly gets framed, but I, I don't agree with that. I think that like constantly we try to, and, and I went to grad school with this, you know, perspective that like, you know, to get funding to do your research, you always have to kind of answer some sort of big question in the field. And, and if you study Neanderthals, that question's always, why did Neanderthals go extinct and modern humans were successful? But like every time someone asks that question, they constantly don't get good answers, right? So like, oh, well, maybe they have differences in dental enamel hypoplasia. Oh, no, they don't. Uh, maybe they ate different foods. Oh, never mind. No, they don't. Oh, maybe they made better tools. Oh, never mind. They don't. So like <laughs> constantly searching for that difference between Neanderthals and early modern humans and constantly falling flat with whatever hypothesis gets put forward. And so thinking that like modern humans were, they were also living in small groups. Um, they clearly had like a little bit more diversified social networks between their groups because of the way the world show that they have like less inbreeding. But right, I don't right, think right. that they were, that they were like somehow, you know, uh, they had this strong division of labor that Neanderthals didn't. Because the modern humans, again, they're still showing, females are still showing all the same traumas on their bodies. Um, they're, they're innovating all these things like, you know, hunting spears and um, bow and arrow and traps and things like that. And I don't think that those things are being innovated just for the benefit of, of men. Uh, mm -hmm. We do see a few differences. Like there are more evidence of thrower's elbow in upper Paleolithic males. Mm -hmm. But even then, like they're still plenty of females that show thrower's elbows. So right. there's like, you know, a few differences start to pop up, but there's no sort of like sea change. Right. That's what, um, that comes with the Neolithic. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, again, reaffirming what Uncivilized is about is I'm really interested Paleolithic, the Mesolithic, the Neolithic, and what, for lack of a better word, went wrong. And, you know, David Graeber and Windrose fucking Dawn of Everything, which not all of it's bad, but I'm really critical of it from what I, you know, I haven't finished it yet. I'm, I'm only part of the way through it, and it's, I have some issues with it. But there's a lot to be said about the diversity within foraging groups. From the from the so-called you know from the, the complex to the simple right what people call that or the aggregate non-aggregate um, you know uh delayed return uh immediate return uh and like the diversity uh within that um but i'm curious in your in your mind why is the upper paleolithic as you mentioned so important for the gendering of labor what is changing because from the from generally the primitivist anarcho-primitivist perspective a lot of it has to seem to do with ritual because ritual seems to be co-developing with that gender division in some way you know and i'm not you know i'm not saying that's absolutely all it is but john zerzan who's a, a is a an author within the anarcho-primitivist milieu kind of talks about how ritual is engendering these differences you know it's we always talk about how biology is not deterministic and it's ironic that it's actually ritual that seemed to have imposed this difference or could have been perhaps even responding and reaffirming those differences. But why does it happen, do you think? I mean, it's Sorry, probably I just threw a lot at you. No, no, no. <laughs> that both these things are reflections of increasing population density. So as groups are getting larger, um, groups are being concentrated into smaller and smaller territories, that one, you have more people available. And so it frees mm -hmm. people up to have specializations like artists, you know, ceramicists, things like that. Um, but also then that would kind of meet that minimum threshold of having enough people to be able to have roles in general, whether that's gender roles or, you know, some, some other sort of like socioeconomic type, type roles. Um, and we really don't see that till like the last glacial maximum. Right. right? And, and I, I'm obviously biased towards Europe because that's where I do my research. But in the last glacial maximum in Europe, right, you have the amount of territory that people could occupy becomes shrinks quite a bit. And they're pushed down into kind of like Iberia and Italy and the Balkans. And population territories become really small. And that's when we all of a sudden see all this cave art and people making all these pendants and doing all these things to kind of differentiate us versus, you know, the in-group in and out-group. Um, right. 
but also like that kind of they're they're able to do that because there's a lot of people in the group and like someone can actually be because I mean, if you look at cave art it's it's so sophisticated this is not just oh, like yeah. the scribblings of a teenager on a wall like these this is someone who's really a very skilled a artist specialist. yeah a specialist and so because mm-hmm. someone's able to kind of develop that specialization which you know what 10,000 hours or whatever assumedly Mm -hmm. they're not participating in other kinds of things they're being subsidized with food by other members of their group which we assume means then like the group is large enough that you can have those specializations um so i think that those two things might be like both symptoms of increased population density but that actually Mm -hmm. doesn't happen till you know halfway through the upper paleolithic that's not something that kind of defines when you actually have modern humans competing against Neanderthals 40,000 years ago, at that point, we still have pretty low population density for both populations, um, mm-hmm. which I always get frustrated by in my own discipline is that they're constantly compared Neanderthals to modern humans they weren't competing with. They compare them to Magdalenian modern humans who are making you know, musical instruments and, and painting Lascaux, and those people are not who they were competing against, right? <laughs> Or compare them to like, mo- you know, compare Neanderthals to modern foragers who are, again, the, you know, apples to oranges. Yeah, okay. So you're talking about population size and density. How does the, an upper Paleolithic density, which you're talking about, might be allowing for the specialization? How does that relate to, say, Hadza or any other contemporary? Population density or distribution? Because isn't it the, aren't these. I'm assuming because based off their land accessibility, it's probably comparable, but I actually have zero idea about that. Could you, and is that, is that related to what, how they practice gender division of labor today? Yeah. To look at specifically the Hadza, what are like average group sizes? I mean, they do have larger social networks. Even if like you're kind of your one group might be in the dozens, you're regularly communicating with larger groups, like your larger social network might be in the hundreds. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I've cited people who work with foragers who argue that foragers live in larger groups than Paleolithic people did. But as far as like what those exact numbers would be for like specifically the Hadza, for instance, I'm not sure. I'd have to actually look it up. Uh, But I do know that for Neanderthals and for like the earliest upper Paleolithic modern humans in Europe, it's, it's still just like in the dozens. Okay, so it's compared. Okay, because I was curious because my mind, my instant thought was, okay, but if they're bigger, I don't imagine pods are in their immediate group but yeah i guess in that sense of in relation to space available but also the larger organization not necessarily band level is probably fairly similar and i or maybe even bigger probably than. that like especially as we said before about modern day foragers living in like less optimal environments that one of the adaptations they've made is to live in like smaller bands yeah okay okay but that's um, that's just my like intuition I, i'm not citing anything there sure and so in, in, in relation to contemporary hunter-gatherers, we get the idea that it be, it's actually become more common for this delayed return. We just had an episode, two episodes where uh, a friend from Thailand was talking about some of the hill tribes who talked about some of who are... They use a very broad definition of delayed return hunter-gatherer that I'm not entirely in agreement with, um, but they talked about how delayed return seems to differ in some way from immediate return. Is there, do you have any insight to how delayed return hunter gatherers are with their gender versus immediate return? Is it more complex or more, more defined in delayed return societies? I mean, again, we're getting a little bit outside my expertise. So, like, I would, okay. I don't want to, like, you know, as academics, we want to make sure, like, everything we're saying is, like, fully sourced and cited. Um, right. I, a lot of, like, we often describe Paleolithic foragers as being immediate return but there's also no, some, lots of evidence that they're doing things like they are investing in long-term sustainability of their environments so like mm-hmm. you know there's evidence in the upper paleolithic of like cutting down trees before you leave an area so that when you come back in a year there's dry firewood available to you mm-hmm. so people are not just kind of like you know uh, on the at brink of starvation just worried oh, sure, about sure. like you know, making sure that you have food today and not thinking too far into the future. Like they're actually like pretty stable and they have like literally like long-term investments in their environment. They're terraforming, you know, like things like um, intentionally burning grasslands that where their preferred prey species live to make sure that like 
you know, the animals that, and the plants that they want to be growing are growing uh, in the long right. term. But I know that doesn't actually get into the definition of like um, delayed and immediate return of foragers today. But obviously, like so many of those questions, we can't really ask of the Paleolithic because we don't really know like all, so many aspects of their behavior. But there is like evidence, at least, that like these individuals are, they're, you know, they're not like the <laughs> living that like short, nasty, and brutish life that often gets sure. ascribed to to what Very it would have been like to be a caveman. Yeah. 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 And it's interesting because, you know, when I speak of immediate return, I'm definitely not meaning to imply that they're living that way. Because if that worked, I mean, yeah, obviously the paleo, the up paleolithic, you see that stronger, also the middle paleolithic as you get further into it. But this terraforming, you talk about this long term investment, right? But that's, to me, I don't know if that's necessarily in contradiction to an immediate return, but I, I see what you're saying that it's not just you come, you do your thing, then you leave. You are prepping, you're thinking long term survival as well it's not just yeah i'm just, just trying to think of like what do we even have evidence for right <laughs> right sure yeah uh that's really interesting and because we're talking about the paleolithic again and you know i'll ask this before i ask the question is what is your knowledge not just of neanderthals and homo sapiens but other homo species perhaps even about their social organization because i find homo erectus Heidelbergensis, and I know the lines between these things are becoming really blurry but do you have anything to say about perhaps how gender division might have developed in those in those species yeah i think a lot of what we're seeing is like this kind of egalitarian pattern is like at least two thousand years old um homo erectus has a lot less sexual size dimorphism than oh, what yeah. we saw in like australopithecines so this this kind of like quote unquote neanderthal pattern is probably established you know two million years ago oh, okay uh, yeah and and I'm very I'm I'm like I'm a lumper so like yes I class I will say Heidelbergensis and Homo erectus because I'm referring to like specific populations but I don't think that they're different species. Yeah, and it, a bit of curiosity because now I'm curious how what where do you land on the date between Neanderthals are a different species than Homo sapien? Oh, so this is like before you know I would I was an undergrad from 2004 to 2008 and this was definitely in that sweet spot where there was a little bit of genetic data which suggested that mm -hmm. Neanderthals and modern humans were truly genetically distinct and weren't interbreeding. And I thought this was like bullshit. I was like, look at the anatomy. Look, <laughs> as we know any two populations of people come together, like they have sex. Um, they haven't been separated enough to be different species. But like I was then kind of really on a fringe with that position at that particular time. And then started grad school in 2008. And by 2010, all of a sudden we have the Neanderthal genome and people are going like, oops, never mind, they interbred um, and felt very like vindicated, you know, even as like a junior person, it just felt so intuitive. Like, why do we think that these people are different species? Just because they're like some regional differences in cranial shape, like that doesn't, that does not a species make. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, even, even, oh, sorry, go on. I just, I just love that now the field is like swinging back towards my position, which has been in that way since basically like I first learned about it, which is like, duh, of course they're not separate species. Um, we're I mean, finally kind of swinging more that way, finally. Yeah, I mean, literally just about three years ago, didn't they come out? I remember that the y, they find that between 150,000, 300,000, I think, the Y chromosome Neanderthals, we replaced it. Some, t some population of Homo sapiens replaced the Neanderthal Y chromosome. Yeah, and so Neanderthals, late Neanderthals, are walking around with modern human Y chromosomes. Yeah, and I mean, this is like all way I'm bring earlier. Up in that paper. And it's also way earlier than we thought humans got to, Homo sapiens got to Europe. So we're like, how the fuck did that happen? And, you know, and it's, I find that, that Paleolithic social relationships, <laughs> I just find so fucking interesting because it, it is in such contrast to what we have today because we're like look at them the only reason we did that is we must have been raping their women it's like i have a hard time believing with all the evidence of population of of intermixing that it's just fucking rape like come the fuck on well and it, yeah it, it's it's like a also kind of a swing against the out of africa theory right because it's like this idea of out of africa in the 90s was this very very strict thing that like yeah, there's evolution going on all over the planet, but only the people that evolved in East Africa are were descendants of. Everyone else mm -hmm. got replaced. Right. And now coming back and being like, oh, actually, no, like the way that we kind of conceptualized it before that evidence that there's kind of gene flow just moving around all the time, like that 
that's also present, right? The answer is somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, it's so interesting to me to think about the possibility of, uh, you know, when, when Homo sapiens meet Neanderthals, who I guess are, you know, we're Homo sapiens sapiens, and it's possibly their Homo sapien Neanderthals or Neanderthalis, I guess is however the classification becomes and how it's going. But the idea of us meeting each other and like, I mean, come on, we look, if you and I look at Neanderthal stall, Neanderthal stall we're going to be like, okay, it looks different, but it basically looks like us. So this idea that these people would have been unable to look at them and be like, okay, yeah, we look the same. You're telling me like that just wouldn't have happened? So you're living in a small group where you're related to everybody and you haven't seen a woman who's not your cousin in six months and like she's a redhead with a big nose. Do you really care? That's, that's a redhead, you know, I have to identify, you know, I have to give it out to the Neanderthals, you know. <laughs> right. I mean, like, this idea of, like, not, like, I remember going to Germany in 2009 before the Neanderthal genome stuff had come out, and, like, I was excavating and having, like, colleagues say to me, like, well, they wouldn't recognize each other as mates, or if they had kids, they'd be sterile like a donkey. And I was like, mm. you know, I'm, like, a first-year grad student, so I can't say that much, but I was like, where are you getting this? This is, this is like total BS. And then the very next year, you know, the paper coming out and my PhD advisor, because I speak German, came by my office and was like, how do I say I told you so in German? <laughs> oh, that's, that's awesome. Um, okay, can you, okay, again, now we're totally off from the original point, but because I love Neanderthals, you're going to have to, you're going to have to bear it with another Neanderthal question. Um, can you clarify something for me? Because I feel like I have this backwards, is that there was some, discrepancies about looking the genome in the the genet what is it the genetic drift is that what it is when the the genes are moving between two populations um gene flow yeah gene flow what is it with that it's it's possible that a neanderthal man had to sleep with a human woman or it's something that because it was more likely something was happening that w one of those depending who the mother was the ch whatever reason a child would live or something like that is that an old theory? I'm totally probably messing this up. Because well, I it's not an old theory. It's, it's just like a paper argued that we're seeing modern humans with Neanderthal contribution, but we're not seeing Neanderthals with a small amount of modern human contribution. So mm -hmm. They were arguing that most of the gene flow was going one direction. And oh. then, uh, I guess, Neanderthal father and modern human mother, or the other way around, I can't remember, were like more successful. But that was like a more successful pairing because of the directionality of the gene flow. But I think part of that, I, I'm, I'm very skeptical of that because we don't have that many Neanderthal genomes to, to right. pair that to. Small, small sample, like population sample, right? Yeah. So the fact that we haven't found an individual that looks Neanderthal and is most Neanderthal with a little bit of modern human DNA, I don't think bears that out. Um, mm -hmm. especially as you point out that the Neanderthals are walking around the late Neanderthals with all modern human Y chromosomes. Right, right. It's going to, it's going to skew possibilities, right? Because we don't have an early Neanderthal to, to base yeah. that off as much. Right, interesting. So there are yeah. like, you know, these like Neanderthal Y chromosomes, I guess maybe the pairing that being Neanderthal males and modern human females were less successful because and I mean, in their time, they didn't survive or thrive as well because we don't have any Neanderthal Y chromosomes floating around. But um, I think these, these theories are, con the narrative constantly changes every, you know, two to three years with these things. So I'm always like, I'll see that stuff come out and I kind of roll my eyes in it and I just wait for another paper. Because I think that's maybe people that aren't academic or, you know, aren't, don't have that mind to realize just because a study comes out and says something doesn't mean the dogma of science has changed. Right. It is just adding another possible perspective to be tested against. You know, I just, and people love to do that. They go to www.imright.com and then you just spew whatever yeah. fucking they found <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, and also, like the people doing the genetic research, they are not like paleoanthropological field researchers, right? So they're publishing what they're doing. They're, you know, with bringing assumptions into how they, they structure the question, but they're not actually experts in like, Neanderthal social structure or you know what it was like to be a Neanderthal and I think this gets back mm -hmm. to like really the, the crux of like why Kara and I did these papers at all was we were reading a number of genetics papers that went into the the null hypothesis being that there was a, a sex 
labor division in the Paleolithic and looking for evidence of it. And one of the papers that was looking for, they, they expected to see a decrease in sex division of labor from the Paleolithic into the Neolithic because they thought, oh, right, male hunter, female gather, it should be less sex differences from the Paleolithic to the Neolithic. And they didn't find it. And then they, you know, act surprised. And we were like, well, if you talk to anyone who studies the fossil record, they would have told you, of course, you're not going to find that in your genetic study. And so really wanting to help reframe that question you know, so that when people are doing research outside of our discipline, that they would mm -hmm. be able to kind of like bring the most likely null hypothesis to the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have, I guess this is the last major question. Perhaps it depends how much you're familiar with it is. Are you familiar with the, the radical anthropology group? Camilla Power and Chris Knight? I'm not, but I'm interested. Okay, so, and this is, I, I now I wish I had Jamie here to talk about this. He's much more familiar, but they kind of have this idea of, like, the sex strike theory. Like, why is it that you look at, like, chimpanzees and, and gorillas, and, you know, obviously there's variation here, but what is going on with this shift from this very often male, single male, patriarchal, for lack of a better word, kind of system Right, where the women are subservient in some ways, right, to this much more egalitarian model in early Homo. And that, perhaps that is a major differentiation, this sort of slow trend towards egalitarianism from, you know, the, uh, the earlier hominins to Homo. And they have this idea that, like, basically certain populations of women would resist or rebel what they kind of call the sex strike. And I hope I'm, you know, and again, I'm speaking on for their behalf, the sex strike that they would be, okay, you need to share with us the meat and treat, basically, for a lot of people, just with respect, you're not going to get sex. And they had sex with less dominant males who were willing to share the meat and be cooperative, and that basically shifted certain behaviors, either socially or genetically, to predispose us to egalitarianism. But the argument has to make it that women are the gatherers and that men are the, are the hunters. And you kind of touched on that early with the man, the hunter theory. And so, you know, with it's interesting. So why did we even adopt egalitarianism? And their theory of that is the hunting model, the male bonds and the female bond, pair bonding, well, not pair bonding, but social cohesion. But the hunting is the core of it. And it necessitates a gender division of labor. Right. So yeah, I, yeah. So you, I, I would push back on that from the just the base assumption, because, you know, we had a number of people push back on our paper of like, well, but chimpanzees this, right? But <laughs> Bonobos are, we're just as closely related to bonobos as we are to chimpanzees. And so to mm -hmm. assume that the chimpanzee model or be stru social structure characterizes the last common ancestor is cherry picking because the bonobo model can just as likely represent the last common ancestor as the chimpanzee model, right? And in the bonobo model, you have social structures where females are a lot more dominant, there's a lot less aggression, Sex is used as a tool to diffuse social strife and, you know, and, and therefore like women are able to kind of like wield sex as something like make friends and diffuse social conflict and use as a, a tool of economic exchange. You have a banana. I want that banana. I'll have sex with you for that banana um, that we don't see in chimpanzees. And what, what went wrong? What went wrong when it was like, was that simple? <laughs> <laughs> right. So I, I always get frustrated when like the last common ancestor is just defaulted to be chimpanzee social structure when it could just as likely be bonobo social structure. Right. And, you know what's funny is, you know, and obviously some people have this idea that bonobo is just a totally like hippie level. And it's not that, but it is comparatively different than a chimp, right? Or like what we can, you know, the, the baseline chimp, right? What I find interesting though is while males are half as aggressive, it's like, female bonobos are actually more aggressive than female chimpanzees because they're in, but it's funny to see when people see they're like, see, they're just as aggressive. But it's like, how is that aggression manifesting? And it's from my understanding, it's in response to male aggression. Like they're standing up and being like, fucking stop. Right. They're not bullies, yeah. you know? And so why, why can't it be that? But I think part of it too might connect to the, and we talked about this, the sexual dimorphism. Right, like if we look at late Australopithecus versus early Habilis, and I know Habilis is a weird one, or Erectus and Ergaster, right? Like that shift. And I'm just so mm -hmm. curious, like why does that happen? And people say, well, the, you know, the hunting patterns and this and that, or the environments. Like, yeah, but like why? 
why you did that work for us? You know, that's what I'm really curious about is how did we become human in that sense? And what, what it means to be human keeps getting pushed back, of course, obviously, and that relates to the Neanderthal, the Neanderthal issue, is that it's possible Erectus was also just as intelligent as us, possibly. And I find that interesting. But again, why, in your mind, where does egalitarianism come from? I guess I'm really interested in that. Yeah, yeah it's hard to answer that question, right? Um, but I, I do think that probably, like, Homo erectus has a social organization fairly similar to what we see with Heidelbergensis and Neanderthals, just based off of kind of behavior and anatomy. And we've, we've created this just so story about how hunting was so important to them and that hunting was this game changer. They're eating more meat that allows males to show off to females. We have sexual, you know, monogamous pair bonding, all these things come out of it. But then, like, you know, there's a paper from 2020 looking at Homo erectus teeth and shows that there's no increase in carnivory with Homo erectus. So, <laughs> oh, from, from, from earlier Australopithecines? Yeah. So, like, oh. we have this, like, story that's so nice that, like, they, they became hunters and it changed the world. But, like, they're not eating any more meat than habilis. So, like, mm. what are they, like, what is oh. different, right? Yeah, um, I guess and for I, me, I know that there's an essay a paper that came out that they hunted African elephants, right? And so the, but it's also, and it doesn't necessarily mean Habilis wasn't <clears throat> for my understanding, but it's also like we see intelligence in social organization required because you can't just fucking do that. You know, one, one erect, one erectus isn't going to go take it down itself. Right. A fucking African oh, elephant. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So. And also like occasionally eating meat, you know, the bones of animals preserve really well in the fossil record. So we right. know so much more about the meat that they're eating and not as much about the plants, right? Mm -hmm. Even though I think most of the time they're, they're still eating like very, very high, they're eating primate diets. They're eating lots of fruits and vegetables. And even Neanderthals constantly get described as like these top level carnivores based off nitrogen levels. And then there's like all sorts of other explanations for their high nitrogen isotope levels. Like the fact that they're, you know, preserving their meat, drying their meat out, which increases nitrogen concentration, or that they're eating lots of mushrooms, which yeah. also concentrate nitrogen isotopes. Like, and then you actually look at their teeth, right, the dental calculus, and it shows that they're eating tons of plants, right? right. <laughs> I mean, so, look at contemporary hunter-gatherers today, and, well, outside of those in extreme, like, polar environments, what is it, like, seasonally it changes, but, like, root-based foods are, or not for plant-based foods are insanely important. This idea that meat's the dominant thing for most hunter-gatherer groups is just not fucking true. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, like, it's funny because, like, I know many times I've been, like, I don't know, like, the checkout line of Whole Foods, and somehow I mentioned, oh, I study Neanderthals, and people were like, oh, like, how do you eat the, because remember the paleo diet was, like, really, really trendy, like, Oh, fuck ago. off. Yeah. yeah and, and, like, how often I've told people, like, if you want to be more paleo, it would just be, like, being a locavore, and eating seasonally would be like yes. the most paleo thing you could do. Yeah. Yeah. This again, and that's the thing is being hard. I mean, we think globally, we're a globalistic society that there must be uniformity, right? That comes with globalization, industrialism. It flattens the experience, but a hundred, hundred other foraging peoples, that's not happening. While they have similar patterns, obviously it's what we're talking about. We can see commonalities, but like the foods, like, so uh, Inuit, right, and their hunting patterns, like, are do they follow a paleo diet and the Hadza don't, or do the Hadza follow a paleo diet and they don't? Because they are hunting extremely different things with very different uh, nutritional intake. You know? Right, because there's not like, one paleo diet. It's You eat seasonally and you eat locally. You eat right. what food is, is available in your environment today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you were talking about the social organization of Erectus, Heidelbergensis, Neanderthal. But you didn't mention us. So by that, are you meaning like the smaller, less, seemingly less complex, less interconnected social organization between families? Or what do you mean about the Neanderthal model? What does that mean? Oh, uh, well, I guess often when I say Neanderthal model, I mean kind of a paleo model in general. Oh, um, okay. But yeah, modern humans... I mean, we, we're very narcissistic. So we always think that like whatever modern humans are doing must be special, must be different, must have been like okay. the best new way of doing things. But 
most of the things that we look at for like, especially the earliest hyperpaleo modern humans, they're doing the same things as Neanderthals. Okay, I thought, okay, okay. I, I wanted to make sure I wasn't understanding. I was like, I've never heard that before. So now you have my interest. But okay, I got you. Um, I, my last question about the research, and I said that earlier, but oops, uh, is are you familiar <laughs> with the book, How the Female Body Drove 200 Years, or 200 Million Years of Human Evolution? It's called, it's, I guess that's the subtitle, the main title being Eve. I'm vaguely familiar with it. Who wrote that? It's a uh, Tat oh, Bohanan. Bohanan. Oh, I'm not familiar with the. I've I've not read the book. No. Okay, just I have it. I'm looking at it on my shelf, and we're talking so much about this, like shifting the perspective from the male dominance, and not even like saying, "Oh, now it's all about women," but understanding the equal contribution of both. Right, having to. Some people are like, "You're overcorrecting." It's like, yeah, but there's a pretty strong fucking bias one way that a strong correction needs to happen and it just kind of reminded me of the book yeah i th i think that's it's the same line as what we're, we're trying to do it's just like evolution doesn't act on one sex and not the other and especially mm -hmm. when we look at you know for most of human evolution there aren't sex differences in behavior based off of you know the, the bony signatures based on wear and tear and trauma the things they're putting in their graves and all these things. And it's like, there's not a male strategy and a female strategy. There's a human strategy. That, that's so well said. Holy shit. That's just so <laughs> succinct. I love that. There's just a human strategy. Good. I love that. That's awesome. Uh, so the last question then totally is, and kind of pulling it back to you as a researcher, and you have been touching on this throughout the whole thing, is what is it being a me? What is the importance of being a woman in academia, particularly anthropology? What are the challenges with that? And for the lack of a better word, what are like the benefits or maybe the things that you you have access to as a woman in anthropology? I mean, I, I love that anthropology as a discipline is actually like fairly female dominated. Like we're producing more women with PhDs in anthropology than men. Um, but unfortunately, like many disciplines, that that there's that leaky pipeline. So though you might be producing more women with PhDs, once you get people in tenure track jobs and then getting tenure and then up to full professor, that that difference in sex skews the other direction, right? And that there's more mm -hmm. full per, male full professors than female full professors. Um, and I think part of this is, is that academia in general, but especially field-based disciplines like archeology, span ecology, field biology, zoology, they are not very, um, conducive to having families. Grants mm -hmm. won't give you money for childcare, for instance. And then mm -hmm. they want, they complain, oh, we have so many more men than women applying for these senior field researcher grants. It's like, because you won't cover the cost of childcare, right? Um, right? And like, I'm in a unique position of like having a partner who works from home, has a flexible schedule. So when I want to go excavate, he comes with me. And this summer, we're going to have a four month old and he's coming with me into the field and going to watch the baby while I'm out excavating. And then I'll come home and with the time difference, it works out nicely. Then I'll take over childcare and he can work remotely for his job back in the U.S. because we'll be in, in North Macedonia. But, you know, that's like I had to really design a family structure that would fit within academia and field work to make that happen. And I'm going to be all over social media posting pictures of me like in a cave with a four month old and a baby Bjorn on my chest to make it clear mm -hmm. that like women can still do field work. You can have a family, you can have babies and still do field work because it's, they definitely do not make it easy, uh, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And we often think of like academia, oh, like it's education. If any discipline is going to be like accepting of, of women and childcare, like it would be academia. And that's really not the case. Um, right. You're an educator, you know, that like, okay, oh maybe God. like teaching, you know, people might have this idea that like teaching high school, oh, you don't work in the summers or you get off at three o'clock, but that's not true, right? You Mark, have to Mark, I wish. Yeah, I right. wish I did. right, it's just, it's not true, right? You still have so much work to do outside of classroom hours. In the summer, you're doing professional development. Like for mm -hmm. me, like as professors, we don't even technically get paid in the summer. Like our contracts are nine or 10 month contracts. We're supposed right. to be not working in the summer, but there's no way you could get tenure if you didn't work. So we're right. out excavating, publishing papers, working on grants, you know, out of the goodness of our hearts, but to keep our jobs. And so no, I think 
it really, it, it hurts, it hurts everybody, but it hurts women in particular. Yeah. You know, what's funny is not so much funny, but the observation I'm making here is the way you're talking about the intentional creation of a family unit is this perhaps a metaphor for the, the agency of women in the Paleolithic. <laughs> and the fact that someone's a homebody at one point and it's not you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, just the fact that we're flexible, right? We'll trade off. You walk the baby, I'll go out, do something out in the home, and then we trade. Um, right. Also, the idea that, like, you have larger social, like, unfortunately, with, like, capitalism and the emph emphasis on the nuclear family, like, we don't have grandmas and cousins and this extended network to help share in child care. But we can also make it. So, like, for me, the colleague I work with, uh, Darko Stojanovsky, who activates, he's got a three-year-old. So, like, we've already been in contact about, like, how do we design our field work to be, like, inclusive and accommodating of the fact that we're both parents, right? And mm -hmm. it isn't just that, like, the assumption is, oh, well, his wife will take care of the baby. No, <laughs> like, both of us have kids and both of us want to design a field work that accommodates that for us. Um, right. So hopefully, you know, we can be a model for other other archaeologists. Um, we also are really in, we have a field school, which we're putting on pause this summer because trying to take care of a four month old and 14 undergraduates seemed like way too much for me. But we run a field school at our um, Neanderthal site in North Macedonia um, because there's, you know, there's been so much sexual harassment, sexual assault um, no. at field programs. There's been Whoa. tons of publications about this, right? But just like you're in a foreign country, usually these things are all run by men, the laws are different um and and people take advantage of that and i've had a number of friends say oh i'm sending my students to your field school because it's like the only one i know run by a woman where i know that this is something that's actively being taken into account with the design of the field school where they're going to be safe right wow that's that's first of all that's amazing so thank you for doing that because i mean i you know i had no idea that that was a prevalent thing but it's also one of those i'm not really fucking surprised hearing it because of the nature of like, I mean, you know, that that's a whole thing you can connect to like MMIW and like and indigenous people are not often assaulted by other indigenous people, but people that are working seasonally in areas like miners or oil workers and stuff like that and like the relationship to yeah. that. Um but that's that's really amazing. And so you're talking about the the that site. What other, I guess as a conclusion, what other work would you, you know, I guess this is where you can plug your stuff. In addition to what you're working on, you've been mentioning some other projects you're working on. And before we recorded, you're talking about a book that you're working on. Do you want to perhaps talk about how people can find that and maybe even support your work going forward? Yeah. So I think Kara and I were already kind of come up with a paper we want to do, which is an obvious follow up to this one, which is how do women's physiology change in response to the, the Neolithic transition? Mm -hmm. um, so we've already kind of outlined that. Hopefully we'll have that um, once she finishes her book, since she's got that her um, Women in Evolution book due to the publisher next month. Um, mm -hmm. So got to get that finished. Um, whereas I'm working on a book proposal right now for a book about um, kind of Paleolithic punks. So the origins of tattoos, piercing, drug use, alcohol, all these things in the Paleolithic. To be more of a pop science book. Um, but it's something I've been kind of playing around with for a while and I think it's be really fun and a, a fun way too to kind of reach a different audience to say like mm -hmm. you know Neanderthals are just like you but in in more ways than you realize um, but I'm, mm -hmm. I'm my research is actually on oral health in Neanderthals and early modern humans and I had started uh, planning a project kind of pivoting to looking at evidence of respiratory health right when the COVID pandemic started and I couldn't go to Europe. So all that stuff got put on ice and now I've moved institutions. But now that I'm like established at the University of Delaware um, and <laughs> after I have a baby this uh, next month actually, uh, applying for some grants to re-pick up that project and look at how um, our ancestors were responding to things like smoke in capes. Uh, we have a paper that we just are sending out right now for review looking at kind of the cost um, and benefits of our close relationship with fire and smoke is kind of helping me um, set up the background for the next grant looking at respiratory health. Interesting. Okay. And you talking about 
I don't know how he reminded me, but a friend sent me a, a page from a book, and there's this excerpt that somehow you've kind of reminded me of is that, quote, the claim that, a, that anatomy or the body is not destiny is not recent, but was made far more stridently in all societies prior to our own. Rituals, ceremonies, raiments, masks, designs, mutilations, and torture, all in order to seduce the gods, the spirits of the dead. The body was the first great medium of this immense undertaking. So that idea of like Paleolithic punk kind of reminded me of that a little bit with the body modification. Yeah. yeah, we think all this stuff is like recent and countercultural, and it's like, no, it's actually like some of the defining features of, of humans. And the fact that Hadza smoke weed and that is like, you know, I'm straight edge, but I find that fucking hilarious that they do it on like newspaper uh, paper. That's fucking, I love that to me. That's, that's just fucking hilarious. Well, and like the very oldest mummies we have all have tattoos. Um, you know, upper Paleolithic people in the Czech Republic were p- doing labret piercings in their cheeks. Uh, oh, shit. <laughs> like, so like pretty extreme piercings that you don't even see that often in, in people today. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I, I'm very, I'm all, all the stuff you're talking about. I'm just so fucking interested in. I don't read enough. Mostly because some of these journals are either, you know, obviously I get it online behind paywalls or the physical copies can be expensive. So sometimes it's, it's harder to get it. And so like having to find it through like scientific journalism, which again, I rag on a lot, but it's like, sometimes that's all people get. So like every time people like yourself talk about the work they're working on, I'm like, fuck, that's so good. I wonder if I'll be able to read it. But with books, I love a book. (laughs) So I have to say, I'm really, I'm really excited for the stuff that you two are working on. Yeah, well, also like in academia, we don't really get like rewarded as much for books, especially like popular science books. They want us to do our own research, peer review. That's how you get tenure. Um, but I feel like we have an obligation to like translate our work for the public. Like the public not could support, you know, National Science Foundation taking taxpayer money and funding our research if they don't see it like as something that is of value to them. Right, right. That's awesome. So I guess, you know, we'll end it here uh, for everyone. You know, thank you for listening, though. I notice whenever I go to the analytics, you'll listen for like 20 fucking minutes. Uh, but, you know, thank you for listening. Uh, Professor, you know, Dr. Lacey, again, you know, this has been great. And it, I emailed, when I first emailed you, again, I saw you in the Far Cry Primal, like historians react video. And I wonder how many people are now going to make that connection that you were the anthropologist who brought up. Is, is that a, was that a, mixed gender hunting party or is that just male dominated <laughs> it's true i did say that <laughs> and that's what stuck out to me and then i read you, i watched that and then i saw your paper like a week later and then i emailed you and i was like wait a minute that name sounds really fucking familiar <laughs> so again thank you for coming on uh this has been great it's unfortunate we couldn't get your co-author, co-author on but i hope that maybe in the future if i could get her on maybe even give more to like the physiological side i think that'd be fucking awesome oh i'm sure she would love to so (laughs) just just shoot us an email we're available awesome thank you and again everyone thank you for listening